Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange team and our partners, I would like, you, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Post-Fire Seeding Methods for Establishing Diverse Native Communities in the Great Basin, presented by Jeff Ott, Research Geneticist from the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station, and Steve Monson, Botanist, retired also from the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speakers or me at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions pane of your control panel at the top right of your screen. I will keep questions for the presenters in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio option selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenters. Dr. Jeff Ott is a research geneticist with the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Boise, Idaho. He previously worked at the Rocky Mountain Research Station Shrub Sciences Lab in Provo, Utah, studying the effects of seeding and chaining following wildfires. His current research focuses on improving seeding strategies for post-fire establishment of native plants and sagebrush ecosystems. Dr. Steve Monson is a botanist retired from the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Provo, Utah. He retired in 2002 after a 34-year career, but has continued to lead many workshops, training sessions, and symposia on regional management issues, and has extensive technical expertise regarding seeding methods. Welcome, Jeff and Steve, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, okay, I've made you the presenter. Okay, thank you. Uh, this presentation is divided into two different parts with uh, myself and Steve. Uh, I'm first going to talk about a research study that I've been working on together with with Nancy Shaw, Rob Cox, Mike Pellin, and Bruce Roundy. Um, we're working to get this published soon. And I actually gave a webinar a little over a year ago in this series uh, that presented some of this, so it, it might seem familiar if, if you attended that one. Um, but uh, the basic uh, focus here then is on looking at post-fire seeding in, in the Great Basin in sagebrush ecosystems. So you can see from these pictures here what we're up against. Uh, wide, widespread conversion of, of sagebrush to exotic annuals because of fire disturbance and consequently the need to, to find effective ways to restore these areas. Um, we have a history of Wildfire rehabilitation has often been carried out using uh, common introduced forage species. But what we're trying to focus on here is the restoration of uh, diverse native plant communities um, that, that serve uh, purposes of eco uh, ecosystem services, wildlife habitat, other things that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more later on. So there are challenges to accomplishing this task of restoration. Uh, because of the extent of the areas in need of restoration um, due to wildfire and other disturbances, the fact that the dominant shrub, which is important, big sagebrush, doesn't recover, it doesn't resprout after fire, and in many areas, those species that would be able to resprout and recover have been depleted. And so there is a need for introducing um, and assisting in the reestablishment of these plants. But uh, precipitation often doesn't cooperate with attempts to establish plants. There's competition from these invasive annuals like cheatgrass. And then when we're looking at using native seed, there's been the challenge of uh, greater cost and limited availability, although as time goes on, this is becoming less of an issue. 
Then there's variation in seed structure and physiology that requires special techniques for multi-species seed mixes. So when we're trying to see the diversity of species, we have to accommodate the, the requirements of each of those species. There are a number of techniques that are available that have been developed for seeding rangelands. And this slide just shows some of those. Uh, Steve is going to talk in, in more detail about some of these. Uh, for this study that, that we carried out, we were focused on rangeland drill and looking at a couple different types of drills and, and how effective they were, and then looking a little bit at aerial broadcast seeding as well. So just a little background on the rangeland drill was developed uh, initially primarily with the purpose of reseeding sagebrush areas. So people were interested in converting sagebrush to, to forage grasses. And there were uh, different models that developed over time. Um, ending with the, the types we have today. But uh, these conventional rangeland drills are characterized by these large disks that create deep furrows. Um, and plants such as crested wheatgrass can, can easily be established using a rangeland drill. When we think about native species that can be seeded with rangeland drills, there are some that, that work well. Uh, species that have seeds similar in size and weight to crested wheatgrass, such as blue bunch wheatgrass, can also be seeded with rangeland drills. But uh, there is a diversity of seed size and seed bed requirements among the native species we would want to establish. And so those with larger, relatively larger seeds, like blue bunch wheatgrass, are, are in one side of the scale, drilling can be used. But things like Wyoming Big Sagebrush that have smaller seeds aren't going to establish well if they're buried at a typical drill depth. So uh, other modifications of techniques are needed. Now one of the first modifications that's required when you're thinking about establishing a, a diversity of species is to have uh, different boxes to handle different seed sizes. So these triple seed boxes have been developed. And in this case, you see a drill that has been retrofitted with those boxes. Um, typically, there's a small seed box, a large seed box, and one for fluffy or trashy seed. Uh, they're equipped with mechanisms to agitate and help the seed to flow through the drill. And so you can get uh, different types of seed. Another modification that you see here, this drill uh, has these uh, aluminum pipes installed, which are taking that the seed from the small seed box and carrying it directly closer to the soil surface. And on those same rows where that's taking place, the, the disks are lifted so it doesn't create a furrow. Um, in this case, every other row of the drill uh, has the disk lifted. So you can establish in separate rows those large seeds that require that can be placed in a furrow and the smaller ones that uh, you want to just place on the soil surface. And then these, these chains will work those seeds into the soil. Another system that's been developed uh, with this Truax Rough Rider drill um, are these imprinter units. They're little brilliant wheels that you can install on the drill. And again, this is a case where you would drop those seeds onto the surface, and then this will press those seeds into the soil so that they're, they have good contact, but they're not buried too deeply. This truck Rough Rider is one of the drills we were interested in. This drill was actually developed because of uh, the interest of people in the Forest Service and the BLM, and and they wanted certain characteristics for a drill. Uh, it's a minimum till drill. It causes low soil disturbance. As you can see here, it, the furrows are actually just very small grooves created by a flat disk 
Um, and it has hydraulic controls, which combine with these gauge wheels, which are a type of depth band, will allow a greater precision to the seeding depth. The press wheels uh, help press that seed into the soil. Planters in two ranks are installed to prevent litter from lodging in the strip. So this has a number of features that are likely to be useful for um, native plant seeding. So in our experiment, we were comparing these two setups that I described. On one hand, a conventional drill uh, configured to seed large and small seeds in separate rows. And then the Trax Rough Rider minimum till drill doing the same thing. And you can see how in separate boxes uh, take seed into to different rows of the drill. So our objective was to compare these two ty types of drills and also to compare drill broadcasting, which is what I've been describing, putting seed through a drill with aerially broadcasting. So we did this by um, taking the seed, instead of putting it through the drill, we, we spread it by hand on the surface to simulate broadcast from aircraft. This was done both in the fall, right after drilling, and then again in the winter, so we could test different timings for seeding. Uh, part of the experiment was to look at seeding rates for big sagebrush, ranging from 50 pyrolyzed seed per meter square up to 500. Um, we had some control treatments where it was drilled with empty seed boxes and then uh, no treatment at all. So with all these uh, different types of uh, treatment combinations, we, we laid out the experiment in this type of format that you see here. At one of our sides, Saver Creek, you can see uh, each of these rectangles indicates a different combination of treatments. These were 70 by 30 meter plots uh, that uh, allowed us to carry out this experiment at an operational scale where we were uh, using the actual machinery at the, um, the scale that you would use in a real seeding. These are study sites was set up over a course of, of years, different wildfires that took place in, in the Northern Great Basin. Um, you can see the selection criteria for this. These were sagebrush sites that had relatively high severity burns, relatively flat terrain. There was some variation in elevation and soil type, you can see here. And these are species that were included in our, our mixes. So these in this drill seed mix, the species with relatively large seeds included these common grasses of Wyoming mixed sagebrush areas, some forbs, and some others that were included at one of the sites. In the broadcast seed mix, we have the shrubs Wyoming mixed sagebrush and rubber rabbit brush, uh, forbs western yarrow and some penstemon species, and Sandberg bluegrass. And a little bit more detail on those species and their their sources and the actual seeding rates at each of these sites. Uh, we tried to keep, keep it consistent. Taylor Creek was a little bit different, but um, was what we put in. And these were similar to the rates that have been recommended by by the BLM. So the the experiment was randomized complete block design with five blocks per site. As I've said, treatments were in 70 by 30 meter plots. We collected data on density and cover during the first and second years after treatment. And I'm going to present a few of the results from uh, analysis where we were looking basically at treatment contrast. We wanted to see across all these sites what was the overall pattern of, for example, difference between uh, where we seeded and we didn't difference between the drill types, the aerial versus drill, and so on. So I'm going to show a couple of tables of those results. So this is showing seeded versus non-seeded treatments. These are uh, density and cover from the second year for each of the species you see. 
we had some, some cover data for exotic species. Um, the p-values are the significance of the difference between seeded and non-seeded, and you see which of those treatments was higher with these in parentheses were marginally significant. And basically what this shows is that for all of these seeded species, we did get higher establishment in the seeded treatments. That's what we hoped for. And at the same time, uh, exotic species, these annuals, had uh, higher cover in non-seeded. So the establishment of the seeded species was suppressing these exotics. When we compared the conventional versus the minimum till drill, this is where all this, the seeds were seeded through the drills. What we found was that for some species like blue bunch wheatgrass and bald brush squirrel tail, it didn't make a difference which drill you used. There wasn't a significant difference. Indian rice grass was the one species where the conventional drill led to better establishment. We think that's because it uh, can handle a deeper seed burial, and the conventional drill apparently uh, did that for it. Um, most of the broadcast species actually did better with the minimum till drill. And this, again, is that arrangement with those imprinter units where seed was broadcast on the surface and then pressed into the soil. So that seemed to be an especially effective way of seeding these species. When we compared the uh, broadcast type and timing of broadcasting, uh, drill versus aerial, both in the fall. Uh, it depended on which drill you were using, the result that you got. So with the conventional drill, it didn't make a difference whether you were using the drill or broadcast seeding. With the minimum till drill, however, um, there were species uh, cases where um, the drill was better. And again, this emphasizes um, those imprinter units and how effective they were. With fall versus winter aerial broadcasting, uh, we found for some it didn't make a difference, but for others, especially where I'm a big sagebrush, the fall was more effective. The winter didn't lead to very good results. And again, uh, why I'm a big sagebrush, when we vary the seeding rates, we found that as you increase the rate, you did get uh, better establishment. Um, you can see from this graph uh, the two different years across seeding rates with the conventional drill and the minimum till. The, the best establishment was with this minimum till drill at the highest seeding rate of about 500 PLS per meter squared. And I should point out that there were some differences in seeding success at the different sites. I won't go into too much detail, but this is just to show that uh, the sites differed both in their mean annual precipitation and in the precipitation during the first year after seeding. And so Glass Butte and Mountain Home actually had below, much below average precipitation, and they were the sites where we didn't get as high of uh, seeding establishment. Glass Butte actually recovered pretty well because of it was a good site condition, and there were uh, perennials that we sprouted on their own. Mountain home, if you can look closely on this picture, you can see the rows of seeded grasses. We did have establishment there, but there was also a lot of cheat grass and uh, annual forbs. Uh, so this is the type of site that continues to be a challenge. We, we need to work on methods that will help us in these sorts of sites. Sailor Creek and Scooby with the relatively high precipitation after the fires, had pretty good establishment. So I'd like to close my section just by uh, saying that we need more of these types of experiments. You could think of this experiment as being a prototype that could be expanded to other areas. And whether it's these specific treatments that are tested in other areas or other uh, types of treatments, um, things like different seed mix combinations, seeding depth, are things that we really ought to uh, to test with these controlled experiments to a greater extent. So I, I would encourage people to, to think about that as they uh, carry out seeding projects. The possibility of including 
control experiments within their, their treatments. <clears throat> and I, I want to acknowledge for this section of the presentation the people that were the, the funding sources and the people involved in this particular project that you can see here. So I'm going to turn the time over to Steve to uh, talk more about designing seating practice and selection of seating equipment. Good afternoon. Um, pleased to be here and I hope that perhaps what I have to say and some of my experiences and here can help you. Uh, I've been asked specifically to talk about uh, equipment uh, that's available or uh, is being developed that uh, can help as we move ahead with uh, community restoration. Um, whether we like it or not, we are faced with quite different issues now in seeding air disturbances than perhaps we have in the past. Uh, the problem uh, that's facing to uh, agencies to a great extent is uh, the need to reestablish habitat for sage grouse. If we're not able to do that, Fish and Wildlife Service is simply not going to back off from listing this plant or this animal. That is a that is a critical challenge to us because we're not there yet. Uh, we have um, attempted, in a sense, to restore forbs and things of that nature, but to to reestablish the diverse habitat requirements of, the, of this bird is is a bit of a challenge. We also are faced with the need. Uh, and recognition uh, nationally to um, provide a, a seed st uh, strategy program for seeding. Uh, there's a tremendous encouragement and recognition of the problem of the loss of pollinators and retaining those. Uh, restoration and maintaining of big game habitats is continuing to be a, a very important issue. Um, we have been working in this and other agencies have for a number of years and yet uh, to a great extent, a lot of our restoration efforts for restoring winter habitat and diverse communities for big game have really not been attained. And then, of course, we're faced with the increasing destruction and repeated instances of fire, and we're faced with trying to come up with, in a sense, with methods to reduce that. And, of course, we realize if we could restore the uh, principal communities that were in place that uh, that would tend to take care of itself. I think it's worthwhile uh, to talk just a bit more beyond what uh, Jeff mentioned about the development of uh, different drills. Uh, the rangeland drill has been around for a long time, was developed in the 1960s uh, by a committee of people that eventually led to the development of the Society of Range Management. But in the 1930s and 40s and into the 50s, the principal amount of restoration work or revegetation work being conducted in the West was conversion of sagebrush sites to seeding of crested wheatgrass and, and other perennial grasses. To do so, these agencies quickly recognized that they needed a drill beyond a uh, typical farm uh, drill that was rugged enough to plant in areas in which uh, debris was left on the surface. Uh, the uh, effort primarily was uh, being directed by disking sagebrush sites and then uh, trying to seed into that uh, uh, really large and uh, continuous amount of debris on the surface. In addition, attitudes from conventional farming uh, operation at the time uh, uh, affected this. and. Uh, people had the idea and the attitude that furrows, deep furrows, were better than anything else as they tend to collect moisture and uh, provided uh, a, long, a better situation for seed uh, germination and establishment. So the rangeland drill was specifically built to be a very rugged drill with large calder disks on it that could operate where there's tremendous debris on the surface and particularly where you had continuous debris on the surface. Uh, and also it was to have uh, the ability to dig deep furrows. Now seeding 
differing species was not a major issue at the time. They basically were seeding grasses that had similar size seed, and they had been testing uh, seeding rates. And they found, really, that seeding uh, gra the grasses they were using at rates around 4 pounds per acre up to 20 pounds per acre didn't make a lot of difference. Uh, they were getting excellent stands with, with low rates, so drills did not have to be calibrated uh, specifically uh, for more than from grass seeding. Um, as we move, though, later on uh, as into other aspects of restoration, fire disturbances beginning in the 19, late 1950s and into the 60s and 70s became a major issue. And those are the primary areas as far as number of acres being planted that, that uh, are being seeded today. Uh, as that occurred, um, the use of drills that could be used to seed grasses uh, were quickly adopted. Fire restoration measures uh, were being dictated to a great extent uh, uh, by programs that uh, distributed money for, for fire re uh, restoration. And that program uh, specifically emphasized the stabili stabilization of soils. And uh, it emphasized the use of uh, species that cost the less and, and could be established. And if agencies or districts wanted to improve habitat for game or other aspects, they had to come up with money from their districts to be able to supplement the money they got for fire rehab. So fire rehab efforts were really constricted to the use of uh, a small group of plants, um, and they were successful, successful in using the rangeland drill, which is currently available to do that seeding. We have now moved, though, toward the restoration of entire plant associations. We're not there yet, but that is the direction we're going. And that requires a different implement and a different set of conditions uh, for us, to, as Jeff mentioned, to seed a multitude of species simultaneously. So our challenges are for the need of additional equipment than just one drill. Um, Wildland plantings, usually ha uh, of, of any type, have to consider seedbed preparation. That's an entirely different aspect than just putting seed in the soil. As you well know, conventional farming and agriculture, farmers use a number of implements to prepare a seed bed. They use equipment to uh, bury uh, debris, to smooth up and compact the soil so it has a uniform uh, uh, surface to it. Uh, they use implements, separate instruments, to control weeds, such as disking and, and other uh, practices. So seed bed preparation is a critical issue in conventional agriculture as well as it is on rangeland sites. And that is one issue uh, that we have difficulty dealing with on rangeland areas because we don't have the multitude of equipment and we don't have the latitude, in a sense, to do what we might consider seedbed preparation. Seedbed preparation also includes the control of plant competition. And there again, with, with the amount of competition that cheatgrass provides to us, we are faced with really challenging issues that we have not addressed. The primary issue in seeding sagebrush-related sites is the problem of cheatgrass and cheatgrass competition. And whether we like it or not, we have not addressed that. We've, we have spent money in developing plant materials, various other aspects, but we have not directed our efforts truly to try and come up with effective control measures for cheatgrass. The primary thing that we've done mechanically in seeding is to come up with and use drills like the rangeland drill 
the cut deep furrows, side cast the surface seed soil, and try to side cast the seed outside of the furrow. That's a challenge that we haven't yet overcome with the equipment that we currently have, and I feel that we need to move in that direction. We have, in addition to that, we have in inherently developed um, resistance to some extent in moving toward community restoration. Uh, various people have spent a considerable part of their uh, careers uh, restoring, in a sense, sagebrush sites or seeding grasses, and they feel comfortable doing that. And there is resistance to some extent in seeding diverse species because there's a bigger challenge and we haven't been quite as successful. But we can't back off. There is also an attitude that there are areas where we receive low amounts of precipitation that we can't be successful in treating. That was found long ago. In the 1920s and 30s, scientists working at that time quickly recognized that seeding in areas receiving less than 12 inches of precipitation was hazardous. And they cautioned somewhat against that. But we cannot back away from those sites. It is impractical for us to, dis to feel as though that we can designate areas that get less than 12 inches of precipitation and success suggest that we're going to set those aside and we're not going to do that. I can tell you that uh, the, the major people uh, uh, in the United States and areas here in the West are not going to accept that. We cannot tell people, look, we've managed these sites to the point that they're so degraded we can't do anything with them, and so we're going to walk away and we're not going to do anything for a period of time. If we take that position, we're, we're in trouble. We're not going to maintain uh, support, and we shouldn't do that just for the resources that exist there. Um, go ahead. Uh, some of the problems, though, uh, I think we need to look at in, in sagebrush sites specifically is that we need to address and recognize the, the presence of native species that remain following disturbances. Because there's tremendous differences in these sites. Some sites can recover on their own, but the majority of them can't. Yet we have species that are there on site that we don't want to eradicate. So it's impractical for us to spray or disc or plow or whatever to create a seed bed and, and eliminate those species. So we have the challenge of leave, leaving those on site. And yet at the same time, we have the challenge of having cheatgrass there in various uh, degrees of abundance that we have to address. And cheatgrass provides a problem for us in that we have to address live plants as well as seeds that are in the seed bank. We can come up with sprays, and, and we have uh, sprays that will kill live plants. But we are faced with the issue that once we do that, we still have seed in the seed bank that we need to deal with. That could be handled with pre-emergent herbicides, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. Another factor that I think we need to address and to bring into um, uh, our restoration approach is that we, we, we need to understand that the establishment of plant communities oftentimes proceeds through a successional stages of plants. Uh, that's not uncommon. Various scientists have written on this, and this is an interesting topic where, where studies at differing elevations find that uh, certain pioneering and early invading species uh, occur at high elevations. For instance, we have slender wheatgrass and mountain brome. And we have showy golden eye and at various other elevations, including in our sagebrush areas, 
some plants that serve well as pioneering plants and compete well with weeds and yet remain as part of the environment are Thurber's needlegrass. Blue Bunch wheatgrass is actually quite competitive and is not as, as weak a species as sometimes people uh, suggest. Sandberg bluegrass can be used for that, for that same purpose. Um, rubber rabbit brush, let's back up to the other side. Backing up to this other side, slide, one of the things that we have observed and I feel very comfortable with is that rubber rabbit brush provides a, a really good um, situation for the further establishment of sagebrush. I, I think if most of you think back on sites that you visit or see on a daily basis, it's not unusual to see rabbit brush along fence lines and other areas where disturbances have occurred. And after they establish, you see sagebrush tracking in behind them. And we have found that to be the case, particularly on mine disturbances, where we've had difficulty restoring sagebrush on barren soils, but we see rabbit brush or allow rabbit brush to extend, extend into those sites and we quickly find sagebrush tracking into that. So I, I think a challenge that we have in our thinking and seeding is that in our planting arrangements and the use of equipment that we need to incorporate and recognize the need uh, to plant uh, species that can allow for successional uh, stages to occur. I'm not suggesting that we go all the way back to planting annuals and then proceeding on to that. I don't think the weeds that we have on site will allow us to, the luxury to do that. OK, with all those challenges, what do we have in a way as far as um, uh, equipment to accommodate all that and are all those, can we address all those items with current uh, mechanisms that are available. These are the general types of equipment that are used and are available and likely will be available. We have drill type seeders which are obviously uh, quite a number of them are built by different seed companies and others and the drills we currently have that have been adapted to rangelands are not the only ones that, that could be used and could be further modified and developed. Again, the rangeland drill has features about that that it can be used for. The Truax drill, the Rough Rider, I think is an improvement and provides it with um, these methods or these features that Jeff pointed out to you. Basically, it provides us with a drill that we can seed multiple species at either singly or in mixtures and we can we can regulate the seeding rate rate simultaneously. We can create and plant in separate and different seed beds. In addition, a primary feature of the, of the Truax drill is it has a hydraulic adjustment to that allows the, the drill to be set and adjusted to the condition of the soils so that you do not plant too deep nor too shallow. The Rough Rider Truax drill also has been developed to have what he was referred to as on-the-go drill. It has the capacity to seed as a no-till drill uh, with these uh, uh, imprinters on it or not, and yet if you don't want to use those and you get into conditions where you want to furl, you can list those, those, that disk assembly up and plant with conver conventional furrow openers. The other major group of, of seeding devices that are used, and somewhat to less extent in the Great Basin, uh, but could be used, are, are modified drills that we refer to as, as imprinters. The Brilliant Seeder is the most common, commonly used. It's widely used in mine reclamation and other sites much more than on rangelands but it could be used and should be used on rangeland sites. There's no reason that it can't be. It, it has a lot of operating features about it that are not as cumbersome as a drill. Um, it's able to handle 
uh, seeds of different sizes. The seed, the unit literally plants by having two rollers beneath the drill that roll along the ground and they have knobs welded on them that imprint into the soil. Uh, the, the soil then, uh, divots are created in the soil and they're not any deeper than the knobs on the drill. So the drill can be used on sandy soils or other soils uh, and you don't plant too deep. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, it has a, a first roller that creates those divots and the seeds drop down behind that roller and then a second roller comes along and imprints the seed further into the soil. Um, there's modifications of that brilliant cedar. Truax has built what he considers a trillion cedar, which has his three seed boxes on it and allows them for separate planting. Other types of imprint cedars have been developed and are available through commercial seed companies our machinery companies, as well as ind independent companies and even individuals. This grassland cedar is used in the Midwest to a great extent and evolved through just a single individual's uh, recognition of mounting some tires on a seeding device and rolling over the ground. And basically they were seeding left, uh, light seeds and uh, eventually they mounted uh, sophisticated seed boxes onto that unit. Um, Mike Bolts a number of years ago developed somewhat the same kind of a drill that he referred to as a jarbridge seed, sagebrush cedar. And Mike had seen, as you see in the picture on the left, areas where plants had been planted out into the uh, wild and where a vehicle had driven along them and created an imprint and you can see on the left-hand side of this screen, the lower picture, you can see stands of sagebrush coming in that uh, furrow or that imprint where a, a pickup or a vehicle had driven. Mike, Mike recognized that, and so he put together uh, just an old fertilized spreader that he was able to modify and plant sagebrush through it. And then he simply built a frame and mounted some truck tires on that frame and drug that along behind the cedar. And here's the picture on the right-hand side shows to the effect of imprinting sagebrush then into a, a burned area in an area south of Boise. So these imprint cedars can be m built with with uh, little work and with little investment, and they can be modified so that they have uh, some unusual features about them. You can use a tire that has a narrow tread to it and and creates a more narrow uh, imprint that tends to simulate a drill roll. Uh, you can put chains if, or drags behind the machine to better cover it. and. You can fill those tires with fluid or cement or whatever you want and get better down pressure if, if you care to do that. Other methods of seeding, and th this does include equipment, obviously, is, is broadcast seeding. I think many of you have been involved in uh, seeding or evaluating seedings where aerial equipment has been used to seed. Uh, both fixed-wing aircraft as well as helicopter aircraft uh, can use different kinds of dispensers. They can use a hanging basket, as you see with this helicopter on the left, or they have a uh, seed storage unit and uh, the, the uh, regulators built into the aircraft. Considerable work has gone into designing a uh, seeding devices that are used on air, aircraft to prevent drift, to minimize the distribution, the spread of the seed, and to localize it, and, and to uh, more effectively plant. Obviously, aerial seeding has some real benefits. 
you can cover seeding uh, large areas in just a matter of a few days with uh, fixed-wing aircraft or helicopters. Oftentimes, you encounter situations when the, when the uh, planting window is narrowed down and you only have a few days or a few weeks when ideal conditions prevail for, for planting. And it's difficult to get across sites with the ground rig equipment, whereas aerial seeding distributes the seed quite well and quite uniformly, but still requires some means of covering the seed. Harrows and drags of some of one kind or another have been modified, have been built by uh, large seed com or, uh, uh, equipment companies, and the majority, though, that we've used have been units that have been built locally. Uh, the pipe harrow, as shown here on the left-hand side, was probably the first major drag that was developed. It consisted of an I-beam in which some pipes were attached to it, have sprockets welded onto them, and they turn independently as they go across the ground, and they dig into the soil and, and create pockets and, and furrows for the placement of seed. More recently, that unit has been modified to, instead of using the pipe on the back of that rail, they use a chain. And they cut a section of the chain and they weld that to it. And that creates an excellent seed bed and gets away from some of the problems with the pipe, with the conventional pipe harrow. But the conventional pipe harrow builds up a lot of debris and has some other problems. But this chain harrow is a unit that I strongly recommend that you, you, you look at. You can cover large areas with this that can be extended to be 20 or 30 feet wide if you want to. And uh, you can easily control the, the uh, tillage of the soil to, to adjust to what you're seeding. Things like spike harrows and other pieces of conventional equipment uh, and drags have been modified and, and are being used in, in various situations. One of the implements that I feel as though that we, we have some problems with, a number of people seem to feel as though that chaining has some real disadvantages and we need to steer away from it. I think that's not correct. The first change that we're brought in and used were made were used to try and uh, remove trees and create a seed bed. The first chains that were used were lightweight chains. They eliminated trees to some extent, but they did not create any ground tillage. And that's a, a number of people don't realize that. They seem to feel that the chain uh, does innumerable amount of damage to the soil, and that's not correct. The first chains then were lightweight chains, and so they went to uh, heavier chains. And in doing so, they ended up with better tillage. Uh, they further went to putting attachments on the chain, as shown on this one slide on the left-hand side. And they were purposely done to create more tillage, not less. In addition, swivels were put in the chain, as shown here to the right of this young lady on the, on the lower pictures. Swivels allowed then uh, the, the operators to operate the chain uh, in different configurations. Instead of the cats operating side by side, it allowed them to move one cat ahead of the other. And in doing so, you lessened or increased the amount of surface tillage and the removal of trees. I don't know another implement that can effectively create and cover seed on a large basis as well as the chain. And I strongly feel that it's an implement that could and should be used in burned areas. It works as well as a harrow or a drill and has, uh, I think, has utility there. Here's a slide coming up now that shows the number of sagebrush seeds we attained by chaining on a burn at Dry Creek here in south of Boise a number of years ago. The site was aerially seeded with sagebrush in the mix with grasses and bitter brush also. And we found in the chained areas on south slopes that we got 30 
thousand seed seedlings per acre. This was after two years. Uh, south slopes, we we, we uh, encountered more seedlings on those because the south slopes were bare of native vegetation. Where on the north slopes, we had more uh, perennial grass and we had more competition. You notice on the non-chained areas, we had about a third less number of sagebrush uh, seedlings that established and made it through the second year. Well, that's a significant increase in with the use of a chain. Now, on the non-chained areas, uh, there were six to 7,000 seedlings that established there, which is sufficient. Yet, the value of chaining sites like that is that you are assured that you're going to get a better stand, particularly in the more difficult areas where just broadcasting with no coverage will not work. Cabling is another implement that we've tended to use in the past but have gotten away from. It was used initially as a means of controlling pinion juniper and trying to um, reduce stands of sagebrush. It was the first implement available on a large scale basis prior to the chain. Generally, it's a cable of about one inch in diameter and about 350 feet in length is pulled between two cats much like a chain is. And you see the, the, the uh, amount of sagebrush here that it tends to uh, remove. It generally breaks down uh, larger plants and drier, dead, older plants. But it doesn't do much in these conditions to, to till the soil and, and plant seed. However, when the cable is moved onto barren soils, as you have with following a fire, it does, it does a sufficient job of, of covering the seed. And there's uh, various things you can do. You can put double loops on the, on the cable. Uh, you can cable in different configurations to increase the tillage amount of, uh, or the amount of tillage that goes on. So these are, these are large scale implements for seed coverage that could be used. We also have modified equipment that I can consider as specialized equipment, like the seed dribbler that are designed to handle large seeds or difficult seeds. Uh, and uh, the seed dribbler has been around for quite a while. I think most of you are acquainted with it. The seed is metered out of this seed box on the cat track here. The seeds dropped onto the cat track and brought around and punched into the soil. And we get excellent stands with larger seeds like whip rose, mahogany, and bitter brush and seeds of that nature. Uh, there are other interseeders, and these are being used more all the time. In the lower left-hand side of this screen, there's two independent seeders with a John Deere label on them. These are called John Deere flex planters. And they can be used in, as, in tandem where you put a number of these seeders on a draw bar and plant them as you do with a conventional drill. The individual seeders can be uh, planted with different species. If you wanted to plant grasses or whatever in one and shrubs in the other, you can do that. They, they, they plant in a furrow that, that is create, created by the unit and you can control the planting depth of these quite well. So th these, are, these are very simple units. They're a lot easier to operate than a large conventional drill. And they're much cheaper. Uh, and they do have a place. Um, that's the end of the photos of the individual items of equipment that, are there, that we have. But this slide is one you might want to look at in the future. This lists some resources or sources that you can go to where equipment is discussed and better photographs are provided and, and write-ups are provided to you that talk about the features and limitations of various forms of equipment and, and methodologies for planting. So I encourage you to use, to use these sources and 
I think they'll lead you to, to other areas for help. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we have a bunch of questions. So let's start with uh, Dean Stacy asks, I may have missed it, but what area precipitation zone was um, Jeff Ott's study done in? Uh, I, I showed slides of the, the areas where the study was done. Try and get back there. <laughs> it's in the Northern Bay Basin. Uh, there's some data on the mean annual precipitation of these sites. Yeah. And, and where they were. So these were all uh, low elevation sagebrush sites in the Northern Great Basin. Great, thank you. Next question, Jason Spence asks, doesn't rabbit brush emit chemicals that suppress competition and make it difficult to establish other species? Well, I've heard that, but I don't know. I don't have access to information that verifies that, but I have not observed that in, in the areas where we have planted rabbit brush as a means of establishing sagebrush. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Don Henderson asks, in arid sites less than 12 inches precip, what are your thoughts on establishing introduced species like crested wheatgrass or other adapted agropyron species to stabilize the disturbed site and to allow subsequent plant succession with native species? Well, I, I think that we've learned that that's not a good thing to do. We're faced with areas today where we've planted crested wheatgrass and now we're planting forage kochia and we find that we are not getting transition to the communities that we wanted. And so we have the we have the situation is okay, we in a sense I guess we can say we stabilize those sites, but they're still not what we want. I, I don't think that that's what we, we should do. I think that we should address the real issues. We need to better understand how to control competition, and we need to understand how better to plant those species. We do have native plants that are as competitive and established as well as, as crested wheatgrass. We have things like poa secunda. Why don't we use it? We have strains of western wheatgrass or sub uh, uh, stream bank wheatgrass that establish well and compete extremely well with with cheatgrass. Why do we steer away from those? The reason that we've gone to these agricultural grasses in the past is that we've been promoted to do that for their forage value, and they are good forage plants. They have good attributes. They produce forage in dry years, and they provide seasonal periods of grazing. But that's not the issue anymore. Um, I, just, I just feel that we're, we're making the same mistake over again, and we're going to be faced with the, with the question of making that transition. Let me ask you this question. How do you eliminate crested wheatgrass? Crested wheatgrass re-roots aggressively after tillage. I've tried to take crested wheatgrass out by disking. It's difficult to do. Crested wheatgrass also seed banks seed for quite a period of years. If your attempt is to try and remove crested wheatgrass, you're faced with a number of years of control. You're not going to do it with spraying it with Roundup. You might kill a plant but you still have that seed bank. I, I do, I'm serious about this. I think we, are, we present ourselves with other issues that are not as easy to correct as we think. I understand the need to stabilize areas and not allow them to, to get any worse. And that means uh, allowing weeds to invade. I see that. I know that's critical to us, 
but I think we need to focus on control with cheatgrass. We've got to come up with methods whereby we can do that effectively. I think that's where we need to be putting our dollars. Okay, thank you. Ronald Stevenson asks, for the last 15 years, it appears that a very large amount of funding has been directed towards finding and developing species of local ecotype to try to achieve better site adaptation. Do you think the money for research on the best methods to do restoration seeding, such as with the seedbed prep, preparation, seeding depth, seeding timing, weed control, seeding methods and equipment, and other factors have been neglected? And is the best planting techniques being regularly used? And are the best planting techniques being regularly used? Well, I, I would agree with him that that's the case. If, if you look at where the amount of dollars that have been spent in coming up with remedial treatments to deal with uh, disturbances, we've, th the majority of our funds have gone into developing plant materials. And that's understandable. Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't, in a sense, object to that. But we really have overlooked uh, development of plant equipment. Uh, what units, what planting devices do we have available today that we didn't have 10 years ago or whatever? We have the rangeland drill and we have the new Truax drill. And that's basically it. Uh, so yeah, I would agree that where we need to be putting our dollar, dollars is in uh, weed control and then uh, appropriate planting where you're using different species. Again, if we could eliminate cheatgrass on our sites, we could, we could successfully seed those areas with a multitude of species almost, you know, consistently. The challenge, the problem we encounter is we've got this competition with cheatgrass and now other forbs or other weedy species that are coming on the scene. Thank you. Paul Schleifle, I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced your name, asks, have you any experience with forage kochia being chained into cheatgrass-dominated rangelands? Uh, yes, I had. In fact, I have to admit that I was one of the people that were involved with the introduction and the development of forage kochia. And sometimes I don't sleep well at night for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, some of the first plantings that uh, made, particularly in Idaho, uh, with Dale turnip seed, we seeded forage kochia into, directly into a stand of of uh, cheatgrass and sagebrush, and uh, we uh, we drug a harrow across that, and we had a very successful stand established. So, yes, uh, that can be done. Okay. Well, that looks like the last question. Um, if you have, if anyone has any more questions out there, quickly type them into your questions pane. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to let you know that um, there will be a three-question survey of this webinar um, as soon as it closes, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would uh, answer those three questions. And a recording of this webinar will be sent to you automatically through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow, and I will also post it on our Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website uh, within the next few weeks. Our sixth webinar in this series, Vegetation Restoration in Response to Pinion and Juniper Control Treatments, presented by Bruce Roundy, will take place tomorrow at 1130 Pacific, 1230 Mountain. Um, let's see. If you have any more questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me at any time. It looks like one more question came in. Uh, Amanda Clements asks, did the sagebrush establish better in the drilled seeding in OTS experiment? Some discussion, please. Re repeat that question. Did the sagebrush establish better in the drilled seeding? Uh, with the with the minimum till drill, I think I emphasized that with the sagebrush, we saw. 
drilling it through that, that minimum till drill with the imprint units was, was very effective. That was more effective than just spreading it uh, between the furrows of the conventional drill. And we also found that aerial seeding in the fall over a drilled surface um, was more effective than in the winter at these sites. So those were the main findings with regard to sagebrush. Wonderful. Okay, well that was the last question. Thank you all for your participation today and thank you so much Jeff and Steve for your presentations. Thank you. All right, have a great day everybody. <laughs>